Ezekiel chapter number 22, and I'm going to read, be re, start reading at verse number 23, and give just a little background about the scripture and what it's speaking of, and a lot of this reminds me of things that are going on today in today's society, how that uh, the church has forgot God, and men have forgotten God, and, and uh, preachers have forgotten who God is, and they've made more of a, a, a money racket out of church than to have a worship, Amen. And so here we find in verse number 23, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening, to pray that they have devoured souls, they have taken the treasure and precious things, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned uh, mind my holy things. Uh, they have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eye from my Sabbath and I am profaned among them. Verse number 26 is a verse here that you read and pay close attention to. You may hear that again. Uh, get some, some good preaching right there, but that's not what I'm preaching on this morning. Her princes in the midst thereof are like ra uh, wolves ravening in the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, sin vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. Did you get that? Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. Beware of those that come in the name of the Lord and tell you things God told them to tell you. Amen. Be careful of those people that rise up and say they've got a message from the Lord, but it's not from the Lord. Amen. Just be warned. Uh, more and more that's coming in these last days. More and more, uh, you know, that, that's coming about where uh, people are manipulating a congregation of people to make them believe that they're of the Lord and they're really not. They're wolves. Uh, and sometimes in sheep's clothing and sometimes not. So beware of those. And, and the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and it vexed the poor and needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Verse number 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I have found none. And what is sought here is someone to stand up for right in the day that this scripture is, uh, has been written and the story has been told land of Israel, someone that will stand up in that day among all that's going on that's evil in that land, someone, some one person, a man, it says, one person that will stand and make up the head. And I will preach a message to you to entitled this, Wanted, a good man to stand in the gap. A good man to stand in the gap. Lord, help me. I beg God, Lord, help me to be one that will stand in the gap. I don't want to go with the flow. I don't want to go just like because everybody else is going that way. I don't want to go with evil because everybody else is going evil. I want to stand for the truth and stand for what's right. And God, help me. So many times I fail. But Lord, help me that I'd stand in the gap. And men here today, God, help us that we'll stand in the gap and make up the hedge especially around our children and for our children. Our children's future depends upon good daddies and good men in this world. And they're getting fewer and far between, more far between. Now, Father's Day came up a long time ago, and I ain't going to go to the history of all that. But as, as we preach this message to you on Father's Day, you remember this, you will never be a good father until you're a good man. Remember that. You will never be a good father until you are a good man. My dad said not to say a whole lot about him. I'm not, but he's a good man. I'll throw that in on the side. Therefore, he's been a good daddy. Amen? He's been a good man. He's a good daddy. But you'll never be a good father until you're a good man. Fatherhood and being a man today is a, I hate to say it, but it's a dying art or a dying form where I see so many people that come along and they don't even act like men. 
They are called, what do you call these people today? That They call them metrosexuals. And that's not a bad word. That's just a term for these men that primp up. And, and uh, you know, they, 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 well, I won't tell you what they smell like. But, but they come in wearing all kinds of perfume. And, and uh, you know, they are everything's put just exactly right. Not a hair out of place and just to make sure I'm not. Amen. But they come in, not a hair's out of place. And, and uh, they, you know, everything just prim and prompt. Uh, uh, everything just right about them. We need some men. We need some men. But we have here today in our congregation, we have some good men here, and I commend you for it. Lord, help me to be a part of that group that sits here today. Now, we've got, there is a, and I'm going to give you a little humor here so you'll think I'm just not beating on you all day. But men uh, have a different language that we understand that sometimes the ladies don't understand. So I'm going to give you a few of these here before we give you a message, just so you understand part of what Father's Day is, okay? Now, sometimes we don't always say exactly what we mean. Like if I tell my wife that I'm going to fix the, uh, the pipe, the drain under the sink, she knows that she don't have to remind me every six months to do that. I will do it sometime. See? That's our way around it. We'll fix it, but y'all don't have to remind us every six months we're going to fix it. We will. It may take a while, but we will fix it. <laughs> when a man says it would take too long to explain, what he's really trying to tell you is, I have no idea how this works. When a man says, when he's sitting around the house, you know, and he's watching the ball game or watching a fishing show or a hunting show, and his wife's running the vacuum cleaner, and when the man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, what he's really trying to say is, I can't hear over the vacuum cleaner. When a man says, that's interesting, dear, what he really means, are, are you still talking to me? When a man says it's a guy thing, what he really means is there's no rational thought pattern connected with this and you have no chance at all of making it logical. When a man, <laughs> when a man says, uh, can I help you fix supper? What he's really trying to ask you is, uh, why isn't supper ready? When a man says, uh-huh, uh, sure, honey, or yes, dear, he means absolutely nothing. It's just a conditioned response. <laughs> that, that about sums it up. Just a conditioned response. <laughs> uh, when a man says, well, honey, you know how bad my memory is. What he really means is this. I can remember the theme, the theme song to Andy Griffith and the vehicle identification number of the last three vehicles I've owned and, and uh, all the deer that I've killed, but I'm sorry, I forgot your birthday. Oh, that's a dangerous thing. Don't ever be guilty of that. Don't ever be guilty of that. When a man says, oh, don't worry about it, I've just cut myself, it's no big deal. What he really means is I probably severed a limb, but I will bleed to death before I admit I'm hurt. So get over here and help me. When a, man, when a man says I can't find it, what he really means is it didn't fall into my outstretched hand, so I'm completely clueless. <laughs> I'm not reading all these. I'll get myself in trouble. I'm about to anyway. When a man says, I don't think I can go today, what he really means is shopping is not a sport, and no, I'm never going to think of it that way. <clears throat> when a man says, I really don't remember saying that, what he really means is because anything I may have said six months ago is inadmissible in an argument. In fact, all the past comments become null and void after seven days. <laughs> What are a few good men? I'm going to leave you with that. That's a bit of humor to take you through till uh, your next Father's Day. 
But what is Father's Day? What is being a good father? Now, you know, I, I worry about society when men can father children and never have nothing to do with them or want anything to do with them. We're sick. That's not being a father. That's not being a daddy. That's going through the motions, going through the act. But it takes someone special to be a daddy and to be a father. It takes somebody with some guts about him and some, that, some men that have learned some things. And I'll tell you, the best daddies in the world come from those that have been raised right. Now, there's a lot of good fathers that haven't been raised in church, but they learn from their fathers how to be a good daddy, how to be a good father. A few good men... The world needs a few good men. Good men are those that have learned to lean on the Lord. Men that have learned to lean on the Lord. Have you learned, men, have you learned to lean on the Lord? Or do you lean on your own understanding? Do you lean on your own devices? Do you lean on your own ways? Ladies, you just put yourself in this and it'll, it'll work out pretty good for a pre-Mother's Day service next year. If you can remember that far. But have you learned to lean on the Lord? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Proverbs chapter number 3 and verse number 5. But good men, good fathers are those that have learned to lean upon the Lord. I was raised to lean upon the Lord, to learn to lean upon him. When all else fails, God's never failed me. Amen. When the world fails me, Jesus has never failed me. When the circumstances of life are all against me, I know that God will never fail me. He never will leave me nor forsake me. He will not fail me. But you've got to learn to lean on the Lord. Sometimes God teaches you those lessons by putting you there where the only way you've got to turn is to learn to lean on Him. But I'll say to you today, He's never let me down. He hasn't failed me yet and He will not start today. The world needs good men that have learned to lean upon the Lord. Learn to lean upon the Lord for salvation. The best daddies are those that know the Lord, that pattern their life after Him, that try to live according to His will and according to His plan. If you're a daddy here today, do you know the Lord? Are you saved? Do you know Jesus? That's a good step in becoming a good father. Men who have learned to lean on the Lord for their salvation and for their strength. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, macho men in the world today, but my strength, my physical strength may not be that good, but I know my strength comes from the Lord, and it's a good strength. Amen? Nobody can defeat my God. Nobody can defeat what He tries and wants to do through your life. If God's put, you, put it in you to do it, you lean on His strength, and you lean on Him, and guess what? It'll work. Some 35 towns is not too big for God in His strength. You'll get tired of it before it's gone. You're going to, you're going to, you, you know, it'll probably come a time when you say, Lord, I don't know if I can get this done. But then God will come along and say, in my strength, you can get it done. He may have already told you that. He may have already said you bit off more than you can chew. There's never nothing too big for my God. Amen. There's never anything that he puts upon you to do that you, by the help of God, can't do it. Amen. And I believe that. You know why I believe it? Because I've seen it in examples in other men's lives. I've seen it in examples in my own life. How if God says to do it, you go ahead and do it. And God will always honor that. You lean on Him for salvation. You lean on Him for strength to do what He wants you to do. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Wait on the Lord. Preacher, He's, got, he's given me something to do, and I can't do it right now. Wait on the Lord. He's given me a task to perform. And I don't know how I'm going to get it done. Wait on the Lord. But preacher, I want to do it now. You do it when in God's time and God will help you. Don't get ahead of God. Don't get behind God. Stay with the Lord. And he'll help you. Stay with Him. 
need some men that will stand for the Lord and with soundness, with soundness, with a good mind, with a good thought process. Now, when I was young, and you can ask my daddy, he'll tell you, if I set out to do something, sometimes I would set out to do it without really thinking about what I was doing. Have you ever, ever done that? I set out one time, Daddy, Daddy helped me finish it, but I set out one time, there was some, Dad let me have a run of the property when I was growing up, as long as it was safe. If I wanted to go build a, build a pond in the creek, he never said, no, don't go build a pond in the creek. He just said, be careful. And I decided one time that I was going to go and I was going to build a pond in the backyard. So I got out there with a garden tiller and a shovel and a mattock. And I'm sure my dad watched me when he'd come home. I, I couldn't have been 14, 13, 14 years old. I was just a kid. <coughs> and I got the garden tiller out there because daddy showed me how to use a garden tiller. And I got out there and I'd... And then I'd take a shovel and I'd shovel it out. And I'd roll it down there and put it on the bank. I went on for days till I had a pretty good sized mud hole dug out. Now I'd thought about digging that, but I had not thought one time about putting water in it. Not one time had I thought about how I'm going to get water in this pond because it was, it was up above the creek. How am I going to get water in that thing? And so, as I, my reasoning process was build a, build a pond. Why did I want to build a pond? Anybody got any idea why I would want to build a pond? Exactly. That's common, isn't it? Common sense thinking to me. Well, Daddy, he, he let me do all that. Let me do all that hard work. Encouraged me along once in a while. And uh, I got to figuring, well, I got this thing built. It was about ways deep on me, which is about three inches deep when I was that short. But no. But it's, a, you know, it's about probably two, three feet deep. So there I've got me a pond. Now I've thought this out real good, Brian. Sound thinking on my part. Not a drop of water in sight. Now Daddy knows all of this. And I learned this out from my thought process years later. He's never told me this, but I know what Dad was thinking. He's going to get that hole dug and he ain't going to have no water in it. What am I going to do? So Dad comes home one day. And he tells me, he says, son, that's about 100 feet down there to your pond. And up here where the creek's at, get enough hose, get enough pipe, and you will run water from the creek down here to your pond. And daddy says, two-inch black plastic pipe is a dollar a foot. No, it's a dollar, ten cents a foot. Ain't that right? Ten cents a foot. So I think I've got to have ten dollars. Did I have ten dollars? Did Dad give me ten dollars? No, but then I'm thinking with a sound mind, okay, if I'm going to make this work, I'm going to have to go get ten dollars so Daddy can help me make the rest of it work because Daddy's got the sound mind because he doesn't thought it all up. So I worked. I don't know how. I'd probably, probably hang in the back of the barn or putting up hay or whatever it was, I finally got $10, and I handed it to Daddy one Saturday, and I said, Daddy, will you bring me back home the pipe? You ain't never heard this story, have you? So I'm with all anticipation on Saturday. I'm waiting for Dad's truck. I come up the road. He come home at half a day on Saturday. He come up the road, and I'm waiting for him to come up on the road, and I see him get out of that truck, and guess what he's got with him? A great old big roll, a hundred foot of two inch black plastic pipe. And guess what else he had? He had a number ten barrel, a uh, uh, wash pan. Number ten is that what they call him? Number them wash them wash tub. Number. 10. He had one of them that he cut a hole in, and he'd welded a little pipe in there for me to fit that 
two-inch pipe over, and we took it up there above the pond, and we set it on the, on the creek up there under a little waterfall and put it all together, hooked that pipe onto it, and, buddy, by the next day I had water in my pond. Amen. Now, that was the sound mind. Mine wasn't thinking at all. You, you know, you, you got a well, but there ain't no water in it. I went over that in my mind. No telling how many times teaching me that you better think before you act. Amen? Sometimes. Now, if my daddy hadn't cared, that'd still been a just an empty hole up there. But I soon had it full of water, and I'm quitting right there because I tell you story after story about what went on at that little pond. It had fish in it, it had trout, it had carp, it had ducks on it. I can tell you all kinds of things, but all because somebody in the family had a sound mind, it wasn't me, it's my daddy, amen? But he taught me a lot. Listen, we need some people with some sound minds that have the ability to think before they act. I'd go over some lawmakers in Washington, wouldn't it, amen? Politics for the day, done. We need some men, we need some men, Number two, have, who have learned to lead. Learn to lead. Number one, they need to learn to lead their own flesh. You know what gets you in trouble more than anything in this world? It's your old flesh. It's your old flesh. You yield to the flesh, I yield to the flesh, and when I do that, I wind up in trouble. How many of you got in the flesh last week and got ill at somebody? Raise your hand. Don't you lie to me. About everybody in the building. If you didn't, you thought about it. And that's just as bad. But we need some people, some men that have, you know, that have learned to lead their own, their own flesh, learned to con- bridle their tongue, learned to control their flesh. This I say, them walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one to the other, so that ye cannot. Do the things that you would. Walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Every day, many times a day, I pray, Lord, help me to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. We need some men who have learned to lead their own flesh, their own families. Families need a daddy. Families need a leader in the home. Families need a daddy that's not afraid to stand up and say, no, you can't. We need men to learn, that have learned to lead their families and have learned to lead their own flesh and and go in the right direction instead of the direction of the things of the world. We need some men that have learned to lead the fallen to Christ. People are dying and going to hell and nobody seems to care anymore. In our community, people are dying and going to hell. Listen, somebody's got to give them the gospel. Somebody's got to tell them you must be born again. We don't need to listen, men. We don't need to let everybody else do it. We need to do it. Learn to lead men, the fallen men, to Jesus. All men have sinned and come short of God's glory. All are sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one. And except we, as believers, tell them, men and women, tell them and try their best, try our best to get them to see Jesus, they're going to die and go to hell without, you know, they're going to die and go to hell. Eternity in hell. I was talking to someone earlier. My my wife's mom passed away last night, and we know where she went. She went to heaven. That's a whole lot easier to accept when, than when someone dies and you're not sure. Because usually if you're not sure, they didn't go to heaven. They went to hell. We need some men. We need some people that will learn to lead the fallen to Jesus. Then number three, we need to, learn to have some men who have learned to love. Now, I'm not talking about lust. I'm talking about loving. We need some people, some men who have learned to love, number one, love the Father, love Jesus, love God. Do you love the Lord today, men? Do you love God, ladies? 
Is it in your heart? Do you have a love of Jesus down deep in your soul? Do you love Him above all else? God help us. But we need men and women that have learned to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brace or tinkling cymbal. The word charity is love. And if I do all that I do and yet I don't love men, then it's a sounding brace and tinkling cymbal. Love the Father. We need men, last of all, to love their family. Do you love your family? I don't know what I'd do without my family. I don't know where I'd be without my family. My wife, my daughters, my grandchildren, my son. I love my family. My daddy. Love my daddy. My brother. Love my brother. Mom, great instrument. Great inspiration to me. I loved her. I don't know where I'd be without my family. I'll tell you where I'd be. Probably in hell or on my way there. But I had a daddy who loved his family. Go ahead and go to church. Never was there a question on my mind what was going to happen on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Revival going on. I, listen, I've missed more than one school day because revival held over a little late through the week when we'd have revival. That wasn't bad parenting, son. That was good parenting. That was someone that cared about me. And now we struggle to get to church, amen, just to get to church. On Sunday morning we struggle. We need some men that will lead their families in the plain path, in the right path, and teach them faithfully unto the Lord. We need some men that will love the fellowship of the church. God's people. I love this place more than any. This has got to be the place. This has got to be. I know Brian's starting churches all over, all over the West, trying to get churches established, trying to get the gospel out to people that don't have the gospel. But I'm telling you what, I've got it here. Amen. This is the place. This is the best fellowship that I know of anywhere around. We need people that will love the fellowship of God's people. We need men that will love that fellowship and say, I want to get my children around the fellowship of God's people. There's many, listen, there's many a Friday night that I would have gotten in trouble had it not been for some men in the church that took me coon hunting. How many have been coon hunting? My daddy take me coon hunting and possum hunting, keep me out all night long, Sometimes never get a coon or a possum. And we got the possum, we didn't know what to do with it. Let the dog kill it and leave it laying there because you can't. I tried to eat one of them one time. Phew, Lord. I didn't think I did it right the first time, so I tried to eat another. Oh, my goodness. I, bet, I won't tell you the rest of that story, but I ain't eating no more possum. But now, coons, I like coons. There's been a many men. That, you know, the, and around my family that took me out, Brian, they take me out on Friday night when most teenage boys out get in trouble. I'd be out on the side of a hill somewhere listening to a dog run. That's where I learned my love for the stars because I'd get, I, I would be after a while very uninterested in their tales that they were telling, whether true or false. And so I'd go find me a place and lay down under the stars and watch the stars and count them. Never did get them all counted. Hey, we need some men that will take some interest, that will love the fellowship and love the family and love people enough to try to in, try to uh, instill in them that there are some values other than what this wicked world has got to offer. This world has not got it. But God has and God's people have. We're living in the last days of time and surely this must be the day when the, the very moment before the Lord comes, God help us that when, we, that when He comes, He will find us fathers to have been found faithful to God. The preacher, I've not been faithful. No, listen, there's never too late to start being faithful to God. God loves us. God loves the church. God give His Son for you and I, surely. 
we can find ourselves in the place where we're going to faithfully serve the Lord. Men, women, I challenge you today to leave here today encouraged in your heart, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to raise my family in church, I'm going to make sure they're here when time comes to go to church because I want them to be strong in the Lord in these last days that we live in. Are you that man? Is there, are you the man that will stand in the hedge and make up the gap? Are you that very person that will say, Lord, in spite of what this, what God, what's going on in this world, I'm going to stand for you and serve you? If you do, God will help you. Father, we thank you for the word of God this morning. Blessed, I pray. God, help us now, Father, in the continuance of the service. God, thy will be done. In Jesus' name. While every head's bowed, no one looking around, I want to pray be someone.